Take your Bibles once again, please, or follow along behind me. Romans chapter 10. As you're open to Romans chapter 10, our title this morning is Man's Greatest Need. When it's time for a presidential election, when it's time for a vote, when it's time for advertising, when it's time for somebody to make a great announcement, this is what we need. Well, I'm going to share with you this morning what God says is man's greatest need. What's the thing that's needed most in the world, even this morning? April, yeah, April 3rd. I have to make sure I get the right month. April 3rd, 2011, 2011. What is man's greatest need? You have your Bibles open. We're going to pick up where we were just reading and pick up with verse 14. Follow along. We're going to just read down to verse 17. It says then, How then shall they call upon him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of pre peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said in, in, the, in his book, Who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's stop and pray again for a moment. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you that you have given it to us. Thank you that you gave it to the Apostle Paul. Thank you that you gave it to our ancestors in this country and, and others. And, and thank you that it's carried on throughout the, year, throughout the world throughout the years. Father, now as we study your word, may we not take it for granted. And may we not treat it lightly in any way. But may we give it the utmost respect and may we realize that every word it says is true. Father, help us our, see our, where our hearts are this morning and where the world is. And we'll give you a thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now my title for you this morning is Man's Greatest Need. Man's Greatest Need. I'll, I'll, just, I'll give you the answer. You can't go home. But I'll give you the answer. Man's greatest need is to hear the gospel. To hear the gospel. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. It's about the gospel of God. It's what the gospel is. It's what the gospel says. It's how it works. In the first three chapters, it's why we need the gospel. Let me tell you. Look around the world. Listen to the news. Read a newspaper. Do we need something? <laughs> Does the world need something this morning? Absolutely it does. Is there something needed in our country? Yes. Is there something needed all around the other countries of the world? Yes. What is it? This is the first thing that they need. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, they may need food and they may need health. I'm going to tell you what. Those are temporary things. And they may need them. We, we need those things. But they need the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. The need for the gospel. Secondly, is the gospel, verses 4, or chapters 4, 5, and 6, the gospel is by faith. You have to have the right gospel. You have to have the right gospel because there are many out there, well, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to have this sacrament, and you've got to have this act, and this thing. No, the gospel is by faith. You can have the whole gospel by faith alone. That's all it is. The other things are a result of the gospel. But the gospel itself is by faith. Number three, how the gospel works. We don't have time to go back, but it goes back and Paul explains it in chapter 7 and 8, how the gospel works. How, how does this, some of you may not care how something works. I like to know how something works. 
Because then if it breaks, I know how to fix it. Well, the gospel will never break. But I like to know, how does it work? What are the little nuances? What are the little things that, that make it unique? Chapter 7 and 8 talk about that. Then, then how does the gospel relate to Israel? You ever notice Israel's in the news every day? Can't get away from it. It's been in the work, and it's in the book of Romans. Israel and the gospel, that's where we're at right now. Man's greatest need. If you got your Bibles open, go back with me to verse 13. Because verse 13 is man's greatest opportunity. In verse 13 it says this, For whosoever, that's anybody, American, Canadian, Mexican, Chinese, black, white, tall, short, young, old, have to be careful with, you know, somebody might get offended. With hair, without hair, you know, okay Bob, alright, we got you. All right, whosoever, that is open-ended. That is, there's no restrictions. Anyone, anywhere, anytime calls upon the name of the Lord. That's you, that's me, anybody else in the world. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. It's not might be saved. It's not someday will be saved. It shall be, it's present tense, at that moment, at that instance, call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Let me ask you a question this morning. When were you saved? When did you call upon the name of the Lord and you were saved? And I know for a fact, because I've talked to just, for the majority of you, 98% of you in this room, I've talked to you about that, but there may be some here that I've never talked to you about that, or we've just never had the opportunity. And let me ask you, every one of you, whether I've talked to you or not, when did you do that? And maybe you'll say this morning, well, I don't know if I've done that, or I haven't done that. That's your greatest opportunity. Call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Okay, so we've called upon the name of the Lord. We've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're saved. I've been a Christian for f how many years, I say? 45 years? All right? Ages and ages. And there's some in this room this morning that have been Christians for a matter of weeks or months. And there's some that might have been a couple years and some have been many years. That's wonderful. Now what do we do? That brings us to man's greatest need. What about, and let me ask you this morning, what about the rest of the world? What about the rest of the world? I want you to see something. I want you to see the role of man in man's greatest need. Verse 14 says, And how... How then shall they call upon him whom they've not believed? How shall they believe on him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You say, great, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ That's wonderful. I'm glad. I'm thrilled. What about those who aren't? That is their greatest need this morning. The greatest need is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. And he gives, he gives several questions here. He says, number one, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Let me ask you something. How can you pray to the God of the universe, Jehovah, when you've never believed on him? I was talking to a young man. Well, young man, he's two years older than me. Yeah, he's a young man. Okay. Uh, this week, never met him before in my life. He called me up about something we're doing here and uh, said, can I get together lunch for you, with you? I said, sure. And, and so I got to know him a little bit, and I asked him. And one of the first things I asked him, I said, have you personally put your faith in Christ by faith alone, nothing else? And he said, yes, I have. Very definite answer. And I said, when was that? And he told me when he was about 19 years old, how he just simply, he knew something was there, he knew something wasn't right, and he simply called out to God, and he said, God, if you're real, you show me. And he came through that, and through some other people, came to Jesus Christ by faith. But how do you call on God on whom you haven't believed? How do you pray to a God you don't believe in? They say there's no atheists in the foxholes. There's some truth to that. Man needs to call upon the Lord, but he needs to call 
by faith in whom they have believed. Notice it doesn't say, how shall they call upon him in whom they've been confirmed? How shall they call upon him in whom they've been baptized? How shall they call upon him in whom they've taken communion? It doesn't say that. It says one thing. How shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Faith is crucial. Faith is, is paramount to everything else. And so, who shall call upon the name of the Lord? They shall be saved. But how shall they call upon Him and who they have not believed? Question number two, how shall they believe in Him? Notice the word in there. You can put the word in or on in the Greek. How shall they believe? I like the word in. Because what it means is you're putting your total self into faith in Jesus Christ. I like that picture. How shall they believe on Him whom they have not heard? Now, you, you, Pastor Dave, you don't, you don't understand. We live in America. We live in the United States. We live in a Christian nation. Everybody's heard about Jesus Christ. No, they haven't. No, they haven't. I can point out several people here this morning that they went to, they went to church not even as a little child, but, but as, a, as a teenager or a young adult, and that was the first time they ever heard about Jesus Christ as far as being the Savior. And being invited to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, and, and so there are millions, there are literally millions of Americans across our nation this morning that have not heard that they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. They are religious but lost. And he says, how shall they believe on Him whom they've not heard? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me back at verses 9 and 10. If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Paul the Apostle is a good example. Paul the Apostle knew about Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle, whose name was Saul, knew who Jesus was. He was that guy who was ruining Judaism. But nobody explained to him that he was the Savior of the world until God spoke to him out of heaven. How shall they believe on Jesus Christ? And notice again, it's the word believe, it's by faith. How shall they believe by faith? The whole context of all the first 13 verses. How shall they believe on him in whom they've not heard? Unless somebody sits down and explains it to them. That is why it's so important that we be a Christian witness and testimony. Some are better at this than others. Some are gifted at this more than others. When's the last time you ever explained the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody else? Let me put it this way. When have you had opportunity to do it? That, that, that's so crucial. Will everybody believe? No. I've shared the gospel with many people. Ah, it's not for me. No, or not now. But then there are some times that God has just prepared their hearts and they're, and they're, and they're ready, and, and you never know where that is, when that is. So you share the gospel and let people respond. You do it lovingly, you do it graciously, but you do it thoroughly. How shall they believe on him of not they've not heard? And how shall they hear? How shall they hear without a preacher? Oh, you say, you say, oh, you're you're the you're the preacher. Let me tell you something. You're the preacher. <laughs> this word preacher here is not a formal um authoritative position in, in the church. This is, this is a very generic term of someone who tells or someone who proclaims. Okay? When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior as an eight-year-old boy, it was not a preacher, although I had heard my preacher father many, 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 many times, more times than I know. And it's wonderful. Let me try. Us, we preachers, we love us pastors. We love to lead people to Christ. We love to see people saved. But it's not just we preachers. It's you preachers. It's us preachers. Anyone who knows Jesus Christ can give a testimony and say, this is what Jesus did for me. And he can do it for you too. 
And you don't jam down your throat. You don't get walked down the street and everybody, hey, I need to tell you about, you know, don't, don't, don't do that. You might get hit. Then you'll be coming back to me and say, that pastor, that doesn't work. I said, no, no, no. Okay? You pray and you look for opportunities and God will open them up. But how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear? Literally what it means is, how are they going to hear unless somebody tells them? Well, hold on, I better get to this. Man needs to call. Because man needs to believe. But first of all, he needs to believe. But before that, he needs to hear. But in order to hear, he needs a preacher. But how's a preacher? How does someone? Well, man needs a preacher to be sent. Look at verse 15. How, how shall they preach except they be sent? If you sit at home, and if you don't talk to anybody else, I guarantee you, you will not share Christ with anybody. Now you say, well, this looks like a formal commissioning or ordination. Oh, it can, it can relate to that. Relate. It can be related to that. But what God is calling for each Christian, you and me included this morning, is to realize God is sending us. Because there are people, I have had people to talk to this week that you don't know, or probably don't know, and I didn't know them before this week, and I've had opportunity to share Jesus Christ with them, but you also have opportunity to share Jesus Christ with people that I'll never meet. And God just asks us to be willing to share wherever we meet people. So he says, How shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of great joy. The last thing man needs is man needs the scriptures. Man needs the scriptures. You say, well, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to do it. You can do it two ways. You can do number one, you can share what happened to you. Just like I shared with you two weeks ago. I was a boy, eight years old, sitting in vacation Bible school. I knew I need to accept Jesus Christ, but I didn't want to be in front of everybody. And the teacher said I could do it right there. And I did. And I remember that as clear today as I did back then. The only thing is I can't sit on those little chairs this high anymore. Well, I can, but it's dangerous. All right? But I remember that. And, and I can share that with you. And I can share with you what I believe, that I believe in Jesus Christ. You can also take the Scriptures. You can take the book of Romans. You can learn the Romans Road. I love that. Take Romans 3.10 and 3.23. Then go to Romans 5.12, Romans 6.23. Go back to Romans 6.5.8. And then go to Romans 10.9 and 10 and 10.13. And you can share the whole gospel with them. Say, how do you know that? Because when I was a teenager, I had a youth leader that challenged me. Learn that so that anybody asks you how to be saved, you can take them right there. Now, you notice Paul does it backwards? So let me put it the right way. What does he say in Isaiah 7, 52, 7? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Where's that? That's Isaiah 52. You notice that's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That's not the Gospels. The salvation of the Old Testament is the same salvation in the New Testament. It's believing God that he would take away the sins of the world. It's just we know how he did it in the New Testament. They didn't know how he was going to do it, but it very clearly says in Genesis that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was by faith. Let me walk through it the other way here. Number one, man needs the Scriptures. It's where you start. It's the first thing. You have to have the Word of God. If you're here this morning you don't have a Bible, see me afterwards. I'll give you one. Because I've got at least a dozen sitting I'd be glad to give away. A lot better in your hands reading them than sitting in some shelf collecting dust. Number two, man needs a preacher to be sent. Man needs a preacher to be sent. Then he needs a preacher to preach. Once you're sent, you know, it's, it's like Jonah. Jonah was sent, but Jonah didn't want to preach. 
Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and he says, I'm going to go to Joppa. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go the other way. God says, no. And he dunks him in the sea, puts him out on dry land. And he says, now go to Nineveh. And he does. He needs a preacher to preach. Then man needs to hear after that. When you preach, you need somebody to listen. You need somebody to hear what you're saying. And when they hear, then they need to believe. And after they believe, then they can call upon God. They can call. Now secondly, I want you to see the role of God. The role of God. Verses 14 and 15 is what God does in us. Now here's what God says in verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, But, 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 but they, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What does God do? God says, I want you to believe, I want you to go tell, I want you to go preach. He says, I want you to share the gospel. And some are going to respond. But let me tell you what I'm doing behind the scenes while you're doing what you see. Number one, the opportunity is given. There's an opportunity given. Look with me. Verse 16 says this. For who, for they have not all obeyed the gospel. It does not say they haven't been given the opportunity. They have been given the opportunity. Some have been given the opportunity by somebody directly witnessing to them and telling them about Jesus Christ and saying Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again from your sin. That song that we sang today. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the, to the what? To the cross. Our debt to pay. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky. It's the whole picture of Christ coming in His death, burial, and resurrection. And He says, sometimes we tell directly, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And you believe on Him and you have your sins forgiven. Sometimes we don't have someone directly telling us and explaining all the nuances of it. But we see in creation around us, we see the world around us, and we see that there is a God. We know that it's not here by chance. We know that some divine creator made this world and put us here and put all things in motion and put all things that work together in harmony. And he says, man is responsible simply by that, Romans chapter 1, to believe in simple faith on Him, so that no man is without excuse. But there will be some, it says here, that have not obeyed. And then he quotes Isaiah again, and he quotes Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 says this, Who has believed our report, O Lord? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Israel certainly had the Word of God shared with them. Israel saw Jesus Christ, but so has the rest of the world. Today, this morning, there are churches, there are preachers all over the world preaching and teaching exactly what I'm preaching and teaching. This morning, there are people out in villages and on street corners sharing the Word of God like we're sharing the Word of God. This morning, there are written books, Bibles, translated into thousands of languages. There are tracts. There is Christian radio. There is Christian television. And it is going out. There is Christian shortwave radio. It's going out. There are CDs. I was going to say cassettes, but there are some teenagers here that won't understand what I mean. Okay? There, there are CDs and DVDs that are out all over the world. We send them out from our church. And what does he say? Some, even though they have that, they have a Christian neighbor, they have a Christian co-worker, they have a Christian family member that has shared the gospel with them and demonstrated the, life, the Christian life to them. They what? Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And some will say, I don't want that. Then that's their choice. That's their choice. My goal is to always leave a door open. Always leave an opportunity open. But he says this in verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing. 
and hearing by the Word of God. Let me share with you what will change lives, ladies and gentlemen. It's this book. It's this book. Let me encourage you, when you witness to somebody, use Scripture. Use the Bible. I see many tracts out there really trying, but they, they just have man's words and they don't have any Scripture verses in it. If you want to witness to somebody, or if you're going to use a tract, let me, uh, American Tract Society, Garland, Texas, is one of the best that I've seen. And they use Scripture very thoroughly. There's a couple that don't. And it's like, it's the Word of God that changes lives. So then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing the Word of God. Or hearing comes by hearing the Word of God. Somewhere along the line, whether you got saved watching a television program, whether you got saved in a church service, whether you got saved by somebody at work talking to you or, or a relative talking to you, somebody along the line told you and you heard and you understood. I did. The Bible says there's no other way to be saved. Somebody shared with you. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now here's my question for us this morning. Now that you've been saved, now that you are a Christian yourself, some for a short while, some for a medium while, some for a long while, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Did you know that right now in our church, we have two men studying for ministry. You may not be aware of that. We have one young man who is away at Bible college and right now is in his senior year of studying to become a pastor and to spend his life preaching and teaching the Word of God. We have another man in our church, you may not even be aware of this, that right now is taking courses online. And he's just getting started. And I was looking over a test of his this week and some books that they're using. And he's studying for the ministry. Why? Because they have a burden for souls. They want others to know Jesus Christ whom they know. Here's my million dollar question this morning. Who else may God be calling out of our church? Now, just because I put the plea out there and I put the need out there, it may or may not be talking to you. Okay? But let me encourage you this morning. If God has already been tugging on your heart concerning this, if God has already been speaking to you about this, what are you going to do about it? I've told you the ones I know about. There may be others that I don't know about. Or maybe this morning you say, Pastor Dave, I never thought of that before. Well, good, let me be the one to introduce it to you. But you see, I remember, I remember in July of 1973 that I was at Heritage Baptist Church in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, and Pastor Charles Benedict was speaking. He was my pastor. He was my preacher. I, I can't tell you what the sermon was on. I have no idea. I've tried so many times to remember. I can't remember the text. I don't remember a single thing that he said. But I know this. I was 14 years old. And you see, you've got to understand that after my father died, some people asked me, David, are you going to be a pastor and walk in your father's footsteps? And my answer was, that was my only Spanish back then. I said, no way, Jose. I didn't ever say that outwardly. I never said that to another person. But inside, I said, there is absolutely no way I am ever going to be a preacher. I am ever going to be a missionary because that's what my father was. My father died doing that. He struggled. It was hard. It was difficult. Sometimes you get very little response. You surely don't get paid very much. That's the last thing in the world that I want to do. And I had a list of at least a dozen different things I'd be very happy and content doing. Until that Sunday night, 
with Pastor Benedict preaching. Pastor Benedict's in Pennsylvania. He's retired now. You've got to understand, I was this tall at that point, and he was about this tall. Okay? And I don't know what he said, but God worked in my heart. And I, he asked for anybody who wanted to commit their lives to full-time Christian service, if God was speaking to them, to come forward. And I don't, there was another person. I don't even know who the other person was. I, I remember nothing about that. But I remember I couldn't sit in my seat. And I walked down that aisle. And he says, why have you come? I said, because I know God's calling me to ministry. And he confirmed that a few months later. That would be in the pastorate. I knew at 14 years old that I was going to be a pastor. That's almost 40 years. That's 38 years ago if you want to do the math. Okay? 38 years ago, I knew at 14. You say, how can you know at 14? Because God called my life. You don't have to be 14. I know a man that was called into the ministry at 60 years old. And he went to Bible college at 60 years old, graduated, and from 65 to 95, he planted, I think, four churches. He's been with the Lord now for 10, 15 years. George Chadwick was his name. So I don't care if you're 14 or, or 64 or somewhere in between. Let me ask you, what is God doing with you? And maybe out of this church this morning. And it may not be, it may not be full time. Maybe you're just saying, Lord, I need to be a witness where I am. You've put me in my position. Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody's called a missionary. We need some good accountants. We need some good mechanics. We need some good, we need some good you know, even... <laughs> Political leaders, we need them. Yeah, that's not a question. Okay? Uh, workers in, in industry, leaders of industry, whatever it may be, wherever God has put you, are you willing to be used where you are or wherever God may call you? Now let me warn you, when you say yes to God, you're saying yes to God. And you never know where he may call you. But I will tell you this. You will never regret it. You'll never regret it. How shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they've not heard? And, and how shall they hear unless they have a preacher? And how shall there be a preacher unless he be sent? And how shall, how shall they be sent? Unless there's the word of God. And then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by that Word of God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. Personal time. I'm going to read it to you. My last slide is up on the screen. It says this, what does God want you to do in the role of the gospel? What does God want you to do in the role of the gospel? I cannot answer that for you. I may say, Lord, I think this one would be a good pastor. This one would be a good missionary. This one would be a good teacher. This one would be a good leader. This one would be a good this or this one would be a good that. But I don't know. It's God who calls who also will do. And what's God calling you to do? We need people who will take the gospel, will take the word of God, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And maybe there's someone here this morning that was just like I was on that hot July night, 1973. And you may say this morning, Pastor Dave, I'm not sure what God's calling me to do, or maybe you know what God's calling you to do. I wasn't completely sure that night. But you say, I am willing to go and serve God wherever He calls me. I am willing to be that proclaimer, that preacher, if that's what God wants. And maybe there's someone here this morning, young, old, doesn't matter who you are. If that is your intention, if that is what you're saying, would you just, with no one looking around, just slip your hand up and say, Pastor Dave, pray for me. I believe that. I'm one of those people. Anyone this morning? Pastor Dave, God may be calling me. 
I don't know where he's calling me, but I am surrendering. I am willing to do whatever he wants me to do, wherever he wants me to do it. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm willing to do whatever God wants to do, wherever he wants me to do it. Is God speaking to your heart? Just slip your hand up for a moment. Let me pray for you. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Anyone else before we close? I'm just surrendering and it doesn't mean God's calling you to full-time, you know, like a pastor or missionary. Maybe a full-time architect who has a great Christian testimony. Anyone else before we pray? You just say, God, use me. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Let me tell you, it's been, it's been men, it's been women. Let the word of God, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. God, use me. I am surrendering myself to be used wherever you want me to use, use me. Anyone else before we pray? Thank you. Thank you. I don't usually draw these things out, but it just seems like God's working a number of hearts this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anyone else before we pray? Don't raise your hand if you don't mean it, but if you mean it, you better lift it. And if you're not sure, you can talk to me later. Anybody else before we close? Oh, Father God, we thank you this morning. For being a great God, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your Son to be our Savior. You gave everything for us. And Father, you just ask us to serve you with our lives in return. Father, I pray that you might guide and direct. Thank you for these five folks that raise their hands. And Father, I want them to know that because I want them to know that they're not alone, that others are having the same burden and the same conviction of God that, that others are that they are. Father, you know these hearts, you know these lives, you know these souls, and I pray that you would just take each of them specifically in the direction that you would have them go. Father, thank you for being a great God. Thank you for loving us. May each and every one of us here serve you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. And we'll give you the thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen.